بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في العظيم أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الرحم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزاء ونعلومك برحمتك يا رحم الراحم I am grateful to Allah for giving me opportunity to be with you for the first youth uh, webinar for KSC and I was thinking of a relevant topic and few ideas came to my mind and finally I decided to talk about to be entirely attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This topic is very important for all of us, especially for the youths, because now you can build your life like this. And it's also very relevant for the current situation in the world when you see that um, there can be very um, crucial cases where you are left without any helper or without enough helpers. And you may think the only way forward is to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is true, but as believers, we need to be always like that. Whether you are faced with difficulties or not, whether you have helpers or not, whether you are oppressed or not, you should always be entirely and solely attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our discussion today is based on a discussion of one of my teachers, uh, I studied more than five years Dars Kharij with uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Qadim al Hairi, Hafadahullah, and he has a book called Tazkiyatun Nafs. Nafs. And this discussion that I am sharing with you is mostly from this book, chapter 14, At Tabatulu Wal Inqita' in Allah Ta'ala. You know that in Surat Al Muzammil, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, A'udhu Billahi Min Ash Shaitan Al Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Vazkur isma rabbik wa tabattal ilayhi tabtila Allah says to the Prophet and through the Prophet to all of us Remember the name of your Lord and detach yourself towards him in a complete manner and way this is Surah al muzammil verse 8. And ulama say tabattul means enqita'ah. We have this beautiful phrase in Munajjat al-Sha'baniyya and in some lectures. We reflected on that. Habli kamal al-enqita'ah ilayk. Please grant me complete or perfect detachment from everything 
an entire attachment to you. Al inqita' ila lamiz and al inqita' and kull shay wal ittisal bi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should detach ourselves from everything and be attached to Him. What does this mean? What are different levels of this? What should be our understanding? So, the first level of al Allah is that when it comes to hope, our hope should be only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to fear, our fear should be only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the sense that we may do something wrong, that he may then deprive us of his blessings. Or we may do something wrong that we may then be uh, entitled or deserving punishment. So our fear should be from his anger. Our hope should be in his favor. And our trust should be only in him. This is very clear when it comes to doctrines, but it's very, uh, you know, challenging when it comes to remembering that and acting upon it. We know that every being comes from Him, every goodness comes from Him. La mu'assara fil wujud illa Allah. As philosophers say, there is no no one and nothing that can have any influence except Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Everything relies on him. Everything is at most a shadow. He is the only light. So there's no provider of goodness or no, you know, threat coming from any person directly or independently. Yaman arjuhu kulli khair. So it's easy based on Tawheed of Ali, unity with respect to divine actions, to know that we should only have our hope in Him and trust in Him. But unfortunately, when we are busy with our life, then we sometimes give prominence or even independence or even superiority, na'uzubillah, to people or things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You think? my doctor, my manager, my boss, my government, I don't know. These are the people that can really change my situation. Or for example, if you are afraid of tyrants, dictators, oppressors, sometimes you may think independent from Allah, they can destroy you and you will be very frightened. But a moment knows that no one can harm or benefit except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even we cannot do anything to ourselves to benefit ourselves to or harm ourselves. I cannot benefit myself independently. I cannot harm myself independently. I cannot decide about my life and death independently. I cannot decide about my resurrection independently. So it's easy to understand, but we tend to forget. There is a beautiful hadith that we actually discussed this hadith a few weeks ago in Arabic lectures on Munyatul Murid. Uh, and I was hoping to get a chance to discuss about it in English as well. It's a very beautiful hadith, Shahid Thani quotes in Munyatul Murid. Also here, uh, Ayatollah Hairi quotes from uh, Al-Kafi. Kitab al-Iman wa al-Kufr Baab al-Takweed ila Allah wa al-Tawakkul alayh The section on faith and uh, disbelief 
Then there is a chapter on delegating and submitting your affairs to Allah and trusting in Him. According to this hadith from Imam Sadiq salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicated in one of the previous scriptures, one of the previous heavenly books, this hadith is kind of, uh, you can say hadith of Qudsi, or a kind of revelation, but not in Islam, a revelation to the previous, one of the previous messengers. Very beautiful, very deep. Part of it is like this. وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي وَمَجْدِي وَارْتَفَاعِي عَلَىٰ عَرْشِي Allah swears by His dignity and glory and grandeur and highness. These are very important things. Whoever puts his or her hope in something or someone other than me will be disappointed and will be humiliated by people. But in addition to being not able to reach what they want and be disappointed, they will be deprived of my nearness because they have committed a kind of shirk. They will be deprived of my nearness and will be far from my favor. Does he have hope in others while everything is in my hand? You should not have hope in people. You should not have hope in governments, I don't know, in organizations. You should have hope in, only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Vayarju ghayri. Does he have hope in someone else? Vayakra'u bil fikr baba ghayri wa biyadi mafatihu al-abwaab. Does he knock with his thinking? Not that physically he's going and knock. No, in his thoughts. Does he knock doors of others while the keys are in my hand? Man dalladhi rajani la'azimatin faqata'atu raja'ahu minni. Who is the one who put his hope for his great needs? And I disappointed him, who was honestly putting his hope in me, and I didn't care, I didn't bother about him, I abandoned him, I left him. جَعَلْتُ آمَالَ عِبَادِي عِنْدِي مَحْفُوظَةً فَلَمْ يَرْضَوْ بِحِفْظِي I have kept their hopes, their desires, their dreams in a safe place, in the right time, in the right manner. I will make them able to reach what they want. But they are not happy with this. They are not happy with me preserving and keeping that for, for, for them. مَلَعْتُ سَمَاوَاتِ مِمَّنْ لَا يَمَلُّ مِنْ تَسْبِيهِ وَأَمَرْتُهُمْ أَنْ لَا يُغْلِقُ الْأَبْوَابَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عِبَادِي I have filled the skies with the those, means with angels, that would never be tired from tasbih, from glorifying me. And I have asked them not to block the gates between me and my servants. فَلَمْ يَسَقُوا بَقُولِ but they don't trust my word. My servants think that the door is closed, they cannot call me, they cannot reach me. 
ألم يعلم من طرقته نائبة من نوائب أنه لا يملك كشفها أحد غيري Doesn't the one who has been afflicted by some calamities know that only I can remove this? No one can do it إلا من بعد إذني unless I give them permission فما لي أراه الله يمعني Why I see him heedless about me when it comes to praying to salah to calling me they take it lightly when it comes to trying others they try them they beg them they do everything to please them a'taytuhu bijudi ma lam yas'alni I have given my servants with my generosity what they didn't ask for. Then I took it, some of it away to see whether they come again to me or not. Is it possible that I give them in the first place and then I take it away to test them and then they ask me, I don't give them again? Without asking, I gave them. يا من يعطي من سأله يا من يعطي من لم يسأله ومن لم يعرفه He gives by asking even if you don't have anything and he gives even without asking أبخيل أن أنا فيبخلني عبدي Am I a miserly person that my servant thinks that I'm not going to be giving him what he wants. أَلَيْسَ الْجُودُ وَالْكَرَمُ لِي Isn't that that generosity is mine? أَلَيْسَ الْعَفْوُ وَالْرَحْمَةُ بِيَدِ Isn't it that mercy and pardoning are mine? They are in my hand. So why they put their hope in others? فَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ سَمَاوَاتِ وَأَهْلَ أَرْضِ أَمَّلُوا جَمِيعًا If all people of the earth and all people of the skies, all inhabitants of the skies, if they all ask me for something and have hope in me, and I give each of them what they all asked for. Yeah? I ask for something, you ask for something, someone else asks for something else. If Allah gives to each of us all of what we have collectively asked for. He says, I will not be losing anything. Man taqasamin mulki mislu uzwa zarra. Even like one part of, for example, you know, an organ of body, even one cell is not reduced. I'm not going to lose anything. فَيَا بُؤْسًا لِلْقَانِطِينَ مِنْ رَحْمِ How miserable would be the life for people who have lost hope in me. وَيَا بُؤْسًا لِمَنْ عَصَانِي وَلَمْ يُرَاقِبْنِي And how miserable is the life for the people who disobey me and they don't observe my pleasure so we as believers have to do two things i am sure this question comes to your mind then what should we do in our day-to-day -day life we have two tasks one to build a very strong relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put our entire hope in Him and be 100% sure that He loves us, He supports us more than even the most caring and loving parents. Many, many times more than that. Love of Allah for His servants is many times more than love of Yaqub for Yusuf. Which was exceptional. Not every father loves his children like Yaqub loved Yusuf. He so much loved Yusuf that 
he became blind because of you know use of being taken away even he had hoped that he's alive but he became blind he loved him so much but the love of Allah for us is many many times endless time more than love of Yaqub for you so we need to keep telling ourselves this reminding ourselves of this and asking him to undertake our life and putting trust in him don't tell him how he should help you don't teach him what are the things that he should do for you you can suggest you can say you know it seems to me with my limited knowledge with my knowledge which is not even a drop of water compared to your ocean of knowledge it seems to me that maybe this is the way but i am very very ignorant you know that so the most we can do is we can suggest but the main thing is to ask him to take over to dedicate our affairs to him to submit our affairs to him keep telling ourselves about his love his knowledge his generosity his wisdom and carry on the second thing is we need also to use wisdom in acting properly with respect to the means and links and causes that are available to us if you want knowledge you ask Allah for knowledge but you go to school you go to Hosea you study you do Mubahasa you take notes but don't put your trust in these even if you go to the best school you have the best teacher best methods best partners for discussion you should not put your trust in them even you should not put 50% of trust in them 50% in Allah or 1% in them 99% in Allah no put 100% trust in Allah because trust should be put on something which is independently working but don't ignore the fact that Allah does things through a system through causes so he says if you want knowledge use the ordinary methods but ask me for knowledge if you want risk okay don't close the door of your house and say oh, oh Allah send me risk no you need to turn, uh, learn some techniques some skills some occupations you have to apply for a job you have to work if you have shop you have to open your shop you have to be doing things properly but don't put your trust in this shop or this work or this salary no just do them like a game if you are playing a game you try to do it properly if it is a match for example and you have competition of for example who is the best driver who is the best runner whatever you do things you know as you are supposed to do but don't take these things too seriously this is just to say to Allah that I am doing my part but put your trust in him only so we should do proper uh, you know uh, work study activism lobbying advocacy but we know that no one no nothing can help except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it makes then these things even more useful more effective if I open my shop and I know that Razzaq is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I can enjoy my work and I can be even more successful compared to someone that thinks his shop is giving him his risk he goes through lots of stress and also would develop uh, you know despair or arrogance 
if things are going well, he becomes arrogant. If things are going well, he becomes very stressful. The second level of inqita is that our aim in life should be only nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeking his pleasure, seeking his face, wajhullah. Neither dunya nor akhirah should be our aim and ideal of life. Only we want his nearness. We are sure that he would always put us in the best place. In dunya, he would put us in the circle of his awliya. He would surround us with the angels. He would send down to us the best of his blessings. In akhirah, he will put us in heaven, inshallah. But that's not our main target, our main goal. Our main goal is to please him. He knows how to look after his people. He knows how to host his guests, his awliya, his friends. We shouldn't worry about his job. If you are invited by a person who has a reputation of being a good host, you don't worry. Is he going to give us water or you may remain thirsty? Is he going to give us you know, food or we are going to remain hungry? Are we safe there or maybe you know, he will leave the door in the night open and you know, animals will come and attack us? You don't need to worry if you have a host who has history of being a good host, a reputation of being a good host. With Allah, we don't need to worry about anything. Just focus on him. So. This is the second thing. It is said that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, towards the end of his life, said this poem: "Taraktul khalqatul ran fi hawaqa, wa aytamtul ayala likay araqa." فَلَوْ قَطَّعْتَنِي فِي الْحُرْبِ إِرْبَى لَمَا مَالَ الْفُؤَادُ إِلَى سِوَاقَ I have left people completely out of desire for you. Even I am making my family orphaned and deprived of having me as a father or as a husband so that I can see you. If you make me, my body into pieces, still my heart is not going to turn away from you. So this was said towards the end of the life of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He didn't do anything for dunya, of course. As he said, you know, Asharan, wala bataran, wala mufsidan, wala zaliman. But he didn't do it even for akhirah. He did it only for pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and going close and closer to him. The third level of inqita, so the first was to put your hope, trust only in him and don't put in anyone else independent from Allah and still do your job as you are expected to be with wisdom. The second level of inqita is to have Allah as the end of your life, as the ideal of your life, not neither dunya or akhirah. The third is that you would have such connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you tend to forget other things or sometimes you completely forget other things maybe this happens in moments of dua or salat 
or tahajjud because a very high and advanced person in tabattul would be able to do both at the same time to be completely attached to Allah but also look after worldly things look after for example things around him people around him pay attention to them if he has a garden looks after the flowers if he has a car looks after the car if he has a house look after looks after the house children looks after them but he's totally attached to Allah okay this is what we have to reach but it's possible that either in a transient situation or even after reaching very high you may have this kind of circumstance this kind of condition that you would forget other things your mind and heart will be diverted from other things you would not have any energy to think about other things this can also happen so this is a third level of tabattul that especially this can happen in salat that for some time you don't think about anything even you don't think about yourself don't think about your body don't think about tiredness don't think about you know i have been you know in sajda for several hours that is what Ahlul Bayt, you know, used to experience. They had so much of love and joy for Allah that they didn't pay attention to other things unless Allah wanted them. If there was a beggar asking for help, Amir al was paying attention, but at the same time when they were removing the broken swords or uh, you know arrows from his body he was not paying attention so three levels of tabattul ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a question may come to your mind this is my last point what about things that we find in awliya or not that sometimes they didn't even pray is it something in, to be encouraged or is something that is only for them? For example, in the story of Prophet Ibrahim, which we find it, for example, in Bihar al Anwar, volume 71, page 156. We find that when they were throwing him into massive fire that they could not even go near fire so they used manjanik to throw him into fire we find that Jibrail alayhi salam approached him and said hallaka min haja do you have any request? He said, Amma ilayka fala. To you, I have no request. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for me. I don't have any haja from you. Then Mikail went to him and he said, if you want, I can extinguish the fire because the treasures of rain and water are with me. I can send, for example, rain and extinguish the fire. Ibrahim said, La Urit. I don't want anything from you. The angel who is responsible for winds. Malakurrih went to him, he said, if you want, I will send wind to extinguish fire. He said, La Urid. 
Then again, Jibra'il asked him, Fas'alillah. So ask Allah. We offered you help, you didn't accept. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Ibrahim said, Hasbi min su'ali ilmuhu bihali. It is sufficient for me that he knows about my condition. It suffices me. I don't need to ask him. He knows my condition. If he finds that it is better to help me, he helps me. If not, I don't ask him to help me. And you know that how Allah helped him. Quran says, قُلْنَا يَا نَارُكُونِ بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ <clears throat> we asked, not only Allah saved him, Allah made fire something pleasant. Now it's difficult to think of being in fire and not being burnt. But Allah even made it more. Allah made fire bardan wa salam, cool and peaceful. This is, you know, greater. So, Ibrahim salam was in a very high level of Allah to the extent that even he didn't ask Allah for help. So, someone may say then, does it mean that we shouldn't ask Allah for help? Or we should ask Allah for help? The answer is, it's always good to ask Allah for help, but sometimes there are moments of trial. Sometimes you are someone like Ibrahim that you want to reach very high levels of Tawheed and you are going to become champion of Tawheed. You are going to become the father of all monotheistic faith for thousands of years. So you need to show that you have so much of trust in him that you would just rely on his choice. Even you don't request because request is existential and it is there. He knows what you want by your entire body and soul. Just it's a kind of formality to express it. Other people should express it. But you reach a level of nearness to Allah and love that you think it might be impolite for me and disrespectful for me and a sign of maybe a little doubt to ask. This is something for awliyaullah and moments like that can happen to them. But when it comes to us, we should always ask. We should always, you know, Request, as Allah said to Musa alayhi salam, ask me even for salt of your food. So, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us achieve this kind of condition. Whether it is time of ease or difficulties, whether it is time of fame or being unknown, whether we are ill or healthy, whether we are rich or poor, we request Allah to help us to achieve this level of reliance on him and being attached to him inshallah alhamdulillah rabbil alameen thank you so much dr Malik. may allah bless you inshallah i think that's such a an appropriate subject to be addressed especially for nowadays and uh, obviously it's uh and listening to you speak, it brings forward certain questions. But um, what we'll do now, if there's a few minutes, we'll open up the floor. Sure. If any of the students have questions, either you can ask in the chat, and I'll, I'll ask questions to Sheikh Shamali on your behalf, or you can just unmute yourself, um, and I will ask a question. Sorry, e sorry. either you can unmute yourself, and you can ask your question directly. Uh, we do have one question from 
Sister Sharika Batua. She sings Salam Alaikum Sheikh Shamali. Alaikum Salam wa Rahmatullah. How can we consistently get closer to Allah even though our hearts don't feel that way? Mm -hmm. Very good question. You know, our feelings are not always correct, are not always reliable. We cannot ignore our feelings because sometimes they are genuine. Uh, for example, if you have annoyed someone, maybe you feel blockage, maybe you feel darkness. But sometimes feelings are there without any reason or without, for example, any uh, reliable reasons. For example, maybe there is reason is that, for example, maybe I am tired, maybe I don't know, I have something bad uh, in the morning, then when I go to prayer, I don't feel well. It doesn't mean my f f prayer is not working, but I don't have good feeling because I was already affected by something bad. What is important is to follow aql, to follow reason. Do things properly. Whether you feel good or bad is the secondary issue. Okay? For example, it's the time of Salat. It's the time of, for example, I don't know, Sadiri Rahim. It's the time of visiting an ill person. Whether you have good feeling or not, whether you are in good mood or not. If this is what you are supposed to do, do it. You shouldn't go after, you know, feelings and emotions and moods. We go by reason. If I have good reason that this is what Allah expects from me, I will do it. So if you want to constantly get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way is to increase your ma'rifa of Him to remember him, to bring goodness to yourself and other people, and carry on. Be persistent. Don't let anything stop you. Sorry. Brother Ahmed Musli, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you doing today? Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Again, thank you so much uh, for giving us the opportunity to to speak with you. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, my question is, when we go towards seeking more attachment to Allah, it is one thing to first understand that we must go with reason, and and feelings are secondary and to increase our might of Allah. My question is, what are some things we can identify that stop us from this? Or in other, in other words, what are some barriers that prevent us from getting mouth of Allah? What are some barriers that, that make us listen to our nafs as opposed to reason? One is, Ignorance, sometimes because of lack of knowledge and proper information, lack of, you know, understanding with the Quran, with the Sunnah, with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, with the, you know, life examples of righteous people, Shaitan create problem for us. Shaitan say, you know, even without doing this, you can, you know, reach. Without, you know, for example, being careful, you can reach. So. Knowledge and ma'rifa is very important. The other thing is determination, willpower. If we want to succeed, we need to be determined. No one can succeed without determination. Even people who have become top scientists, top artists, top footballists, I don't know, top politicians, even not top, even successful ones, even if they're not most certain, they have to, to work hard. You cannot sleep and you know eat and, for example, enjoy yourself and become successful in any field. And when it comes to this path, of course, we need to be determined because everything matters. 
even one bad look can be a problem. One bad word can be a problem. Even bad thoughts, you wish bad for people, for example, you feel jealous toward people can create problem. So we need to be determined and then everything can help. So this is the third thing. Also, in a particular way, doing zulm is very destructive. If you do zulm to people, especially those who are under your care, those who have no supporter against you, those who cannot challenge you. You know, sometimes I do zulm to my neighbor, it's terrible. But my neighbor can stop me. But if I do zulm to my children, where can they go? Or for example, if a government does zulm to its subjects and they have no helper, or if boss of a company and the employee are, you know, worried that they may lose their job, they keep, you know, doing zulm to them. Be very, very careful not to do zulm to people who have no helper other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zulm is very destructive and with zulm we cannot go forward. So these are some of the most common issues that we need to observe. And then there are things that can have very positive impact and pave the way for you. Like if you are kind to your parents, you have du'as and not only du'a, because sometimes parents make du'a for parents, uh, for children anyway. But if in their heart they are very happy with you, they are pleased with you, it's very important. They have du'as, they have happiness. Saliya Rahim is very helpful. Helping the poor people, needy people, vulnerable people. These are the things that Allah loves so much that in return, he paves the way for you, gives you lots of energy, lots of success. So if you are careful and determined, it's not, you know, very difficult. But if you want to be lazy and careless, it's impossible. Thank you, Shida, so much. May Allah bless you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for long life. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Asanto. Thank you. Yeah, Brother Wilson, you can take your question. Asanto, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Shatna. You're welcome. Although I know this uh, lecture was intended for the youth, I feel like I was perhaps the target of this uh, of this lecture. I benefited mm -hmm. so much from it. Um, I actually have two questions. Yes. Uh, one, um, is in relation to to this lecture, um, and you know, as you know, we read in Surah Ghafir, um, we say, uh, Allah, inna So, what is the uh, difference between tafwid and tawakkul when it comes to reliance? And then I'll ask my second question after, inshallah. Yeah. In my understanding. Tafwid can be a higher level of tawakkul. So tawakkul means that you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But maybe still you think you are yourself doing something. Yeah. Uh, the example that I use sometimes is this. For example, imagine I want to drive my car and there is lots of heavy snow. Okay? I cannot move. The tire is, you know, uh, evolving and I cannot move forward. So I ask someone to help me. I say I cannot, you know, come out of this. I need help. So someone comes and helps me. I am holding the steer and accelerating and he is pushing me and I go out. But sometimes I feel that no, I cannot do anything. It has reached a point that I need someone to come and even hold the steer. 
Okay, so I totally submit it. I say, no, I go away <laughs> because it seems that I am doing more harm, causing more problem. So I just submit it to him. So, Tafiz is where you reach this understanding that it seems you are useless. You feel that, you know, I cannot do anything. It's better if I just, you know, keep a distance and leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I may cause some problem. But tawakkul is very general. Tawakkul can be when still you are doing something and you know that you can, for example, do something. So it's a kind of higher level of tawakkul. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, Allah bless you. Yeah, Allah bless you too. Thank you very much. Sheikh Shamali, there's two more questions that came in. Yes. Um, this one's from Sister Zahra. She's saying, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Shamali. Alaikum salam. Um, I'm a little bit confused with the part of whether we should ask Allah or not. So should we be like uh, Nabi Musa and ask for every little thing? Or should we be content knowing that God knows what state we are in, like Nabi Ibrahim, right? uh, We should be content, but still ask and pray. Uh, the case of Hazrat Ibrahim is very exceptional and it's not where, uh, you know, we uh, need to follow as our example. That is for very high level. Uh, for us, the general example is to ask Allah for everything. This is the way we find in du'as of Ahlul Bayt. You see in du'a Makarim al Akhlaq, I don't know, du'a Aliyatul Mazamin, for example. Uh, you find emphasis is put on the spiritual needs and hajjah for Akhirah, but even worldly things are asked. We ask for shifa, we ask for risk, we ask for, you know, long life, yeah? yeah? So we can ask for everything and we should ask for everything because for us, we are in such a level that even dua is a way to connect. If we don't make dua, we may forget our reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim has a special relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has passed these stages. There's, thank you so much, Sheikh Shaman. May Allah bless you. Uh, there's one more question from um, Sister Zahra. is just saying thank you very much and asking that Allah bless you for your time. Um, Sister Zainab Hussain is asking, uh, she's sending her salam to you. Salam alaikum, Sheikh Shumani. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, we, are taught, we are taught as Muslims that Allah never overburdens us. Yes. But at the same time, we are tested with bada and can fail those tests. How can we acknowledge both beliefs without finding them somewhat contradicting? He never overburdened us, but sometimes we put ourselves in difficulties and sometimes, no, it was something bearable, but we didn't act properly, okay? So there are two things. Sometimes I am in a situation which is really burdensome and I cannot cope with it because of my bad choice. I have to be careful. Okay? For example, if I go to a desert without taking any guide, any map, any telephone and keep going, going, going and then I get lost. And then I am dying and starving. I cannot say to Allah, you know, why you are putting me in this situation which I cannot tolerate? You could have stopped me. Yeah? Or for example, you know, I give my money to someone to work with without carefulness and then he will, you know, 
take away my money or I don't know, he will become bankrupt, then I suffer, then I lose my house, I lose everything. Uh, I have to remain on the street. I cannot say why Allah has done this to me. I have done it to myself. So he would never put us in a situation that is too difficult for us. We cannot cope with it. But we may put ourselves in that situation. Number one. Number two, most of the time, we don't utilize all our capacity and patience. We quickly complain, say, you know, it's too much, too difficult, too painful. But we see other people in more difficult situation can cope with. If you yourself in a good mindset, if you are determined, you can also cope with. Most of people, 99%, even more of people, they never utilize even 50% of their capacity. We can be much, much more productive, much, much more successful if we really utilize our capacity. Imagine... For example, how much you can resist against hunger throughout the year, the maximum you can resist is seven hours, eight hours, yeah? But in the months of Ramadan, you resist 18 hours. Maybe if you train yourself, you can even resist longer. Just drink water and carry on for two days, three days. One of my relatives, you know, uh, only drank water for 40 days. I'm not saying you should do it, but he didn't die. He, he's living now 20, 30 years after that. So it's not that we are not able to cope with difficulties. We are not utilizing our capacity. So Allah never overburdens us with things that we are not cope, able to cope with, unless it is a matter of punishment for our own wrongdoing. That is possible. Maybe Allah sometimes makes halal things haram for some people. Quran says, فَبِذُلْمٍ مِنَ الَّذِينَ حَادُوا حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ طَيِّبَاتٍ أُحِلَّتْ لَهُمْ Because some of the uh, Bani Israel did zulm, Allah made some of the halal things prohibited for them. Yeah? This is punishment. This is not just test. But without punishment, without you doing bad things, without you doing unwise things, you will, he will never ask you to do things which are not possible or even near impossible. No. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah would not ask you anything to do unless it is within your capacity, within your power. Thank you so much. So Zainab is sending, uh, sending, extending her thanks to you. Sh Sh May Allah bless you. You know, uh, we have a, a ruling. We say, "Azaruratu bil ikhtiyar la tunafil ikhtiyar." You know, because you know, when you are in emergency, sometimes things which are prohibited will be permitted. Yeah. For example, if there is emergency, you are dying out of starvation, then you may eat haram just as much as to save you. For example, there is no halal meat. There is haram meat. You can eat. Just as much as it can save you, okay? Or there is water which is maybe, you know, nudges, but you are dying out of thirst. You may drink only enough to save you, okay? We say, But Sometimes people put themselves in such situation. 
Then ulama say, then here it's not permitted. For example, if someone likes to eat haram food, says, okay, I take haram food and for, you know, 12 hours I go to the desert and I am dying. There is no halal food. I eat this or I drink this wine <laughs> to save myself because now it's zarura. Ulama say no. You put yourself in this. So you are still free and responsible. Okay? So you cannot make yourself and put yourself in a situation that you have no other choice and say, then I am exempted. Thank you, Sheikh Shaman. Yeah, um, if there's time, I just I want to maybe ask one or two questions. Or I think here um, nowadays, given the current situation that's happening globally, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of movements and a lot of different shifts that are happening. Um, you know, um, politically, and uh, I would say maybe even spiritually. Um, so I wonder if you could just speak to, and I think it's becoming very, very clear that the delineating mark between haq and batil is becoming extremely evident and manifest. Um, given some of the um, the gatherings that are happening globally, it's, you can see where the, the majority of people are, um, they're supporting you know, the, the concept of justice and uh, standing on the truth, the side of um, supporting um, those who are being oppressed. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if you don't mind maybe taking a minute or two to speak to the importance of sticking close to our ulama during these times, um, you know, seeking guidance from them and the importance of gaining knowledge to ensure that as time continues, that we remain on the, the straight path and adhere to the, the side of Haq. Yeah. Actually, this was one of the topics I was thinking to discuss. It's, uh, it's a very important topic and it needs some discussion about Haq and Batil and the combats between Haq and Batil. Very briefly, it seems that the main confrontation in Akhiruz Zaman is not between Islam and Kufr or between faith and kufr, being faithless. The main challenge is between faith and nifaq, hypocrisy. Kufr and nifaq both are on the side of batil. But kufr is more pure battle and therefore less powerful. Hypocrisy, nifaq, is a combination of haq and battle. So it's less pure battle and therefore more powerful. <laughs> so haq, when it is more pure, is more powerful. Battle, when it is less pure, is more powerful. Yeah, because battle is nothing. If it is absolute darkness, it would not attract anyone. But if darkness obtains some light or covers itself under some light, then that will be misguiding. In Dua Yiftata, we say, Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin karimah. 
تو عز و بهن اسلام و اهل و تو ذل و بهن نفاق و اهل نه تو ذل و بهن کفر و اهل اوکی سو دی ایشو ایز نفاق نه کفر وید کفر وی دون هاب تو مچ پرابلم But with nifaq, we have lots of problems. Because nifaq doesn't say what it is in the mind or heart of them. They always say good things, nice things. They, you know, wrap things nicely, you know, they decorate it. And therefore, they manage to deceive some people who are not very deep, who are not very insightful. They manage to deceive them. On the other hand, the problem is that on the side of Haq, also people are not always 100% with Haq. We see people do bad things and give bad reputation to the side of Haq. They do also Zulm, they do also some of the bad things. And people look at those bad things and say, these people are wrong people. Look at good things of the other people, they think, oh, they are also good people. Okay? If hack was really 100% hack and bottle was 100% bottle, no one would go for bottle except very vicious people. The problem is that the people on the side of hack, sometimes they do their own things. They don't follow the leaders. They don't follow uh, hujja of Allah. They don't follow revelation. They don't follow aql, which is hujja of Allah. And they give chance to the side of bottle to look at them and point at them and say, look what they do, they are bottle. So they put everything they say and do under question mark. What we need is to reach the point that people of Haq, even if they are not many in number, They would be very holistic and consistent in being with Haq. Everything we do, we say, every judgment, every word, every silence should be based on Haq. If we reach that level of purity, then Nefad will lose its attraction. But unfortunately, it's very hard to find even in a small scale, even a small city, that whatever they do is 100% hack. It's very difficult, unfortunately. On the other hand, they are very capable of deceiving people by saying good things or pointing at the bad things that the people of hack do. So, The more we move forward towards the coming of Imam Mahdi al Jalalullah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, the more contrast will be made between the two sides. And we have to be very, very careful first to make sure that we are on the side of the truth, and secondly, to call people towards that. And we beautifully say in Dua Iftata. تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك. We should be then calling people towards obedience to Allah and becoming leaders of people toward the path of Allah. So be on the right side, then call people towards the right side, and then be leaders of the right side. This is what we have to achieve. And this is only possible if we have knowledge, wisdom, determination in 100% following Haq. Not doing zulm to anyone, not doing injustice to anyone, because then Batil use this as an excuse. Points at our mistakes and says, you know, these people are bad people. Thank you so much, Shaykh Shumar. Yeah. Um, just one last point, if you can comment. Um, um, we're always um, 
very inspired by the, the youth that come into this program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their level of sincerity, um, you know, the coordinators that also uh, dedicate their time to working with the, with the youth. Um, and it's the, uh, it's the motivation and the, the, the interest that the youth themselves have in learning about their being and about practicing and about getting closer to Allah that um, is, is part of the energy, you know, that, that keeps this, this program moving. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you had mentioned in the beginning was, you know, about building this relationship with Allah, knowing that Allah is love, that He's generosity, and that Allah is wise. If you can, if you can, maybe as the ending, just give us all maybe two or three tips on some of the best or ways to build this strong connection with Allah. We appreciate it. It's difficult to choose some over others, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I say some few easy things. One, uh, if you have your parents, be very, very respectful to them. This is a motorway to heaven. Be very kind, respectful, caring, loving to your parents. Number two, do always some charity work and as much as possible keep it to yourself. Something that is only between you and Allah. It is also very helpful. Their du'as, even if they don't know you, even if they don't make du'a, just the joy you bring to their heart will help you a lot. Number three, be always with wuzu. When you wake up, make wuzu and always try to keep wuzu. If you go to washroom, make wuzu. Wuzu is noor. And if you are old, if salat is for a few minutes, it's great. But wuzu can be for hours. So it's very good to be always in with wuzu. And do your salat on time. If possible in Jama'ah, Jama'ah, if not, for Allah. Uh, but do it always on time. If there is Jama'ah later, it's better than for other, but normally Jama'ah is also on time. So don't lose Salat on time. These are few things that are practical. There are more, but few very powerful things. Having kindness towards your parents, doing some charity work, especially if you can keep it secret, unless you have to you know, do it in a collective way, but as much as possible, don't say it yourself uh, for sake of privacy. Wuzu always, and Salat on time. These are things that can connect us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then, it's all a matter of mindfulness. There is nothing like mindfulness, remembrance of Allah, sense of mindfulness. Remind himself of his good attributes, remind himself of he, what he has done for you, of his blessing, of his bounties. These are few things that are very, very helpful. So much, May Allah bless you, inshallah. The more you talk, and the more I'm going to keep you. <laughs> I need to keep talking. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. May Allah bless you, inshallah. You inshallah. Please remember us in your du'as, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, Sheikh Shamali, as we mentioned in the beginning of the session, um, we heard the sad news today of the passing of Sayyid Asad Jafri in Toronto. Yes, what was the reason? Yeah, it seems like he had a heart attack. Oh. Yeah, so it's a big major loss to uh, to the Ummah and to the, the community, especially to the youth. Um, yeah. He was the religious director at the Al-Sadiq school. He his, was director, huh? He was, yeah, was a religious director at the Al-Sadiq school and he, he was just yeah, very, very active um, in the community in general. And extremely active with the youth, played a major you know, role um, in terms of being a role model and, and guiding the youth. 
it's gonna be his his loss is definitely gonna leave a big hole. Um, Ali Juma, I think he also taught Madrasa on Sunday. So if you can close up, you know, Sheikh Shuma, you know, just these times like this when you get these messages, these are the times where you actually makes you stop and whatever you're doing and you know, it's it's a reminder of our temporariness and if you can just close us off in Dua, uh, Sheikh Shumali would be uh, greatly appreciated. So maybe first we can recite Fatiha for him. There's also uh, uh, one of our KLC members who's uh, family members in a critical situation right now. If we can also keep them in our thoughts and in our hearts, yeah. uh, when we uh, yeah. say Allah, inshallah. Allah, Muhammad, Oh Allah, we request you humbly to elevate the position of Brother Sayyid Asad Jafari and all the mu'mineen and mu'minat who die these days and nights especially those who are martyred those who are not doing anything wrong or not saying anything wrong except that they want to live a dignified and peaceful life Please elevate their position and take them towards yourself to the highest heights. And please help their families to cope with these great losses. And please increase their likes in this world. Please give all people who are ill especially those who have serious illnesses or who are injured or who have mental problems, psychological problems or who suffer from traumas please be their healer, their healer and give them Shifa completely and quickly and swiftly and please keep us and our youths always on the right path please expose the ugly faces of your enemies and enemies of humanity so much so that nothing can cover them again and please bring the light of the truth and light of your names and your religion and your cause out of everything that we do, we say, we plan, let us reflect always your light and let us always shine with your light, inshallah. Please hasten the coming of Imam Zaman and Isa alayhi salam and bring all the people of Tawheed together and all people of peace and social justice together and make them suffer a masseuse, a kind of uh, wall that no one can break, no one can penetrate. Please strengthen our families, our communities, our institutions and Keep for us our marajah, our godly scholars, our true seekers of knowledge, our teachers, our volunteers, and give long, healthy, dignified life to our parents who are alive and enable us to serve them and make them happy. And those who have passed away, please be very kind and forgiving and generous with them and reward them endlessly on our behalf. Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen. May Allah inshallah bless you and uh, we request Allah inshallah to elevate the position of
and we'll see that's a deal for you, inshallah. Thank you so much, Sheikh Shamali. Appreciate you. your company you. as usual. And pray, inshallah, you will have lots of good, inshallah, meetings, inshallah, for. Yes, with your Dua, Sheikh Shamali. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh Shamali. Thank you, Sheikh Shamali. Thank you, Sheikh Shamali.